My name is Lou Katsos and I'm president of the uh, East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance, known as EMCA to everyone. Uh, we're having a, one of our uh, cultural events tonight. Uh, usual, we do business events and cultural events. Tonight is uh, more on the cultural side. We're going to have um, an event on Hagia Sophia. The name of the event is uh, December 27, 537 AD, Hagia Sophia, its history, uh, architecture, and cultural contributions. We decided to do it obviously in December because this is almost the 1500th year of uh, Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia obviously is a, a major uh, a landmark uh, and basically cultural contribution uh, throughout, the, throughout the world and recognized by everyone as being one of the greatest architectural treasures in the world. So we, we want to go into it. Uh, part of it has to do with what's been happening recently in, in Turkey and some of the comments by Erdogan. Uh, and we thought it would be nice to uh, bring back the history uh, that we commonly have. It'll be the first in a series, uh, what we call the Byzantine series, uh, that we're going to have at uh, EMCA, or the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance. The second event will be on May 29th, uh, which will be uh, a commemoration of, of May 29, 1453, and the fall of Constantinople. Thank you, welcome. We have a musical venue tonight, plus we also have some great presenters. Stick with us, we'll have a great time. Thank you. A very good friend from Chicago is here. Alexander has written two books. The Eagle Has Two Faces and Hidden Mosaics and Aegean Tale. Fantastic books. Link up with Alexander. You'll be shocked at the type of stuff that his books contain. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Luke Katzos. I'm the uh, president of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance. And it's uh, wonderful to see you uh, right before Christmas. You know, it's a wonderfully decorated place. Many of you have been to our events before. And as you know, we do both, um, both business events and also cultural events. When we were putting together the program last year uh, for this particular year, there are certain things we wanted to do. One of them was to uh, create sort of like a Byzantine series. And tonight is going to be uh, the first of our Byzantine series events. Uh, this will be about Hagia Sophia. We chose December for the obvious reason because uh, in uh, December 27, 537 AD, it was consecrated by Emperor Justinian and, uh, and the Patriarch Mena. And, uh, it has a special meaning to all of us. The second Byzantine event of the, of the year will be on uh, May 29th. It will celebrate, if celebration is the word, uh, the fall of Constantinople in, uh, on May 29th, uh, 1453. And we'll do it actually on, on May 29th. We may do it as a, as a musical tribute, uh, we'll see. Hagia <coughs> Sophia, of course, uh, many of you have visited uh, Timpoli, as we say, or East Timpoli, or what they call Istanbul, what we call Constantinople. Uh, and all of you have obviously different feelings about it and uh, certainly memories about it. One of the first times that I visited the city and visited uh, Hagia Sophia, my memory was it was the first time that uh, I took my son on a trip abroad by ourselves. And uh, it was a uh, a fantastic uh, experience for me. And actually, the last time that I visited Hagia Sophia was when my son, who's now a professor in Dubai, called me and he said, Dad, I'm going to a convention in uh, Istanbul, Istanbul uh, and would you like to meet me there? So I just flew over for the weekend so I could spend some time with my son, and of course, we visited uh, Hagia Sophia again. Again, Tonight, uh, there's going to be two components to, uh, to our event. One will be a musical presentation, which, uh, you know, and, and Mike will be, will be playing the tsura, and I'll introduce him in a second. 
everyone has their own feelings. My, my feelings relate to a lot of different things. When I first went there, one of the first things that I saw in the balcony area was in fact the, the image of crosses that had been crossed, that had been taken out. Uh, the other thing I did, which may sound a little weird to, to everyone, is I, I went directly to find the, uh, the tombstone of Dandolo. Uh, Dandolo was the, uh, the Dodge of Venice, who in uh, 1204, um, basically rather than going to the Holy Land to liberate the Holy Land, he basically decided to, uh, to sack uh, Constantinople. So one of the things I wanted to do when I went to Hagia Sophia was basically find his tombstone and basically spit on it. It makes sound crazy. But <laughs> It's not funny, but that's, uh, that's my story. I have a lot of stories, but it's not about my stories tonight. It's about uh, Anya Sophia, and we have a great panel that has been assembled, and uh, uh, John Fotiadis, who's our vice president, will be introducing everyone in a second. What I'd like to do is introduce Mike Savas, okay, who will play for us the Tsura. And when we put the event together, understand that all of us are basically friends. And uh, everyone wanted to jump in and basically be part of the presentation. And, uh, and Mike, uh, a great friend, we asked him, can he play a musical uh, uh, presentation before the event? So I'll introduce Mike Rizzo Savas.
Mike and Billy, Billy was also on the panel, uh, you know, they had the group Profita, uh, where they do Byzantine rock operas. Uh, they are on YouTube, uh, they're fantastic, they're going to be very well known, uh, they're very well known right now in our community, but they're going to expand beyond, beyond our community. So thank you, thank you so much, Mike, for, for playing for us. Um, here at EMCA, we're very fortunate to have, uh, as officers and as people who are involved in EMCA, uh, very talented people. Uh, one of those talented people is uh, John Fotiadis, who is the, the uh, vice president of EMCA, uh, national and international known architect. Uh, when I had brought up the, uh, the event, uh, he said, Lou, let me take this one. And I said, it's yours, man. So, uh, John Fotiadis. Thank you, everybody. Uh, first off, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I just want to say a few thank yous before we get into it. Uh, thanks to Lou for his vision uh, in taking EMCA from a concept and making it into something real. Uh, also, a big thanks uh, to a couple of people that have been behind the scenes. Uh, Nick uh, Mahaidas, our technical guru. Ahmed uh, Hasabala, my business partner and a co-founder. Uh, Steve Ivalis, uh, Magniti, the two very nice people at the front who you've met when you were coming in. Uh, a special thanks to Kalyopi Balatsukas, who's an archaeologist by profession and a new friend of EMCA who helped us out with some of the panel questions. And of course our panelists, Alex Bellinis, uh, Dean Sarigos, and Billy Prisopos. I've gotten the opportunity to get to know them all uh, fairly recently. They're great people and very, very uh, well versed in, uh, in their areas of expertise. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have them. Um, so, I will make this very short because we have a lot to get through, but um, what I'd like to do is take you through a very quick but immersive architectural history of this building so you can at least understand why it looks the way it does, where it came from, uh, and I guess later we'll discuss where it's going. Uh, Hagia Sophia is one of a handful of buildings in the world uh, that gives pause because while it was designed as a church, uh, to serve a very specific purpose over the millennia, due to the uh, historical events that surrounded it, uh, it has now transcended into something uh, completely different. Uh, what that is and why that is, is something that I hope uh, we'll discuss this evening. So let me give you a, a quick background on the architecture and let's begin. Uh, first, a couple of milestones. Uh, that take us through the, the quick history of this building. 330 AD, Emperor Constantine I, as you all know, decides to move the epicenter of the known world 900 miles east to the ancient city of Byzantium, establishing what he calls Nova Roma uh, as his new Christian world capital. The city, almost from its inception, becomes popularly known as Constantinople. Uh, on the site of Byzantium's ancient Acropolis, on the tip of a promontory jutting into the Bosporus, two churches known as a yes, Sophia, Holy Wisdom, are built and destroyed through the civil unrest over the following two centuries. The patriarchal cathedral we know as a yes, Sophia, and the structure presently standing today, uh, is dedicated in 537 AD. It remains the mother church of the Orthodox Christendom for close to 900 years until the so-called Fourth Crusade, which Lou brought up, uh, a few moments ago in 1204, a Western European army uh, on its way to Jerusalem decided to uh, stop in Constantinople and take pretty much everything that was there. There are a few horses in Venice that you can see as a result of that excursion. Um, the Latin conquest uh, was short-lived and the church was soon restored to, uh, to its Orthodox cathedral. And then we come to May 29th, 1453, uh, a day of tragedy or triumph, depending on whose history you're reading, Constantinople falls to the armies of Mehmed II. After the city is taken and upon entering the building and declaring himself Caesar of the Romans, Kaisar Irum, he immediately commands a senior imam to ascend the altar and declare the name of Allah. The cathedral thus is converted into a mosque. The building remained so until 1934, when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, founder of the modern Republic of Turkey, de effectively decommissions the building, uh, now located in what is known as Istanbul, and declares it a secular space, converting it yet again, this time into a museum, uh, which it remains today. Uh, some local context. Most of you have been to this city, some of you have not. 
the image on the, on the left is uh, a satellite photo of present-day Istanbul. You see that promontory on the lower part of the photo, and I don't know if you can see it from here, but the red dot marks where Hagia Sophia is located. The two images on the right, one is a, a rendering from antiquity, the other is a, an, a fairly recent image, both taken from the same uh, location, that is southwest facing northeast. In both images, you can see Hagia Sophia's location is prominent uh, and still is uh, a major landmark in the city. A couple of quick facts that I'll just take you through. Uh, the architects, Anthemius of Trailes, Isidorus of Miletus, were more scientists. They were called mechaniki or mechanoki. Uh, these architects were chosen because they combined their practical and theoretical knowledge. The construction took approximately five years. The, the building design really had no an antecedents, but uh, it was comprised of, of current elements, which you'll see in a few moments. Uh, the uniqueness of Hagia Sophia is, is that its architectural form makes it difficult to classify. It's been called a domed basilica, but you'll see it's, it's far more than that. The main challenge, of course, is its size. The dome is 100 feet in diameter and designed to seem as if it floats uh, over the uh, congregation and over the space. The structural supports are not clearly defined uh, or visible, and this was intentional. Uh, the dome that's there now is actually a second dome, uh, a prior one that was shallower, which you'll see in a moment, was destroyed in an earthquake. Um, and the, this page ends with a quote by Procopius, uh, the historian of the, em of the emperor who said, it steals not to be founded on solid masonry, but to be suspended from heaven in that golden chain and still cover the space. So, a lot going on with uh, with Hagia Sophia. Uh, the precedents for this building uh, go back historically, and I'm going to go through this very quickly, but again, it's important to get a foundation. The Basilica was a Roman secular building. It was designed for people to gather, make transactions, conduct business. When Christianity became decriminalized in the Roman Empire in the third century, it needed a, a building to conduct its, uh, its activity. Uh, Emperor Constantine, among other things, decided to take this secular building, which had no previous spiritual or religious association and, uh, and use it as, uh, as the model of which church, most churches still uh, use today. Uh, it was a usable model and it memorialized his, uh, his piety, so we can thank him for that. These are various basilicas, both pre-Christian and post-Christian at the city. The dome, of course, is, is another thing altogether. It dates back to uh, the Stone Age. It has a long legacy in our collective memory. Uh, you remember the Tholos tombs from Mycenae, those are forms of domes. But by the late Hellenistic and Roman periods, domes came to symbolize the representations of the cosmos. The most famous of antiquity, the Pantheon, which you see here, uh, created a house for all the gods, but it was also a cosmology uh, for the Roman world rendered in concrete. Domes also represented the protectiveness and a canopy. Uh, both of these ideas translated into the Christian uh, symbolism. So the dome became a covering from the altar as well as a representation of heaven beyond. These are just various floor plans of churches over the last thousand years. You can see how it develops from the basilica, how the dome and the basilica begin to fuse together and create this new archetype that we're all uh, so familiar with today. That lower left-hand plan that you see is actually old St. Peter's. It's the one that predates the church that Michelangelo designed uh, in Rome. These are three Hagia Sophias. Uh, the first one in the foreground is the Basilica, uh, built roughly around the time of Constantine. The second one in the middle shows the, the church proper uh, with the shallower dome that was uh, destroyed in an earthquake in 537, and then the new one uh, that we know today uh, in 562. When you look at the ground plan of this building, it's almost as if a basilica was cracked open and stretched lengthwise, and a dome was uh, introduced. You can see a spatial hierarchy in this building. Even if you're not an architect, you see there's a hierarchical aspect of space. When you look at the section, there's a crowning element in the middle, and then it cascades off to the sides. Everything is focused on the center. Architecturally, how did it work? How did this floating dome uh, uh, that Procopius uh, talks about uh, appear? Well, it's all about this image, which is called a pendentive. The pendentives you see in Orthodox churches today 
When you have the dome, it can rest on a drum, it can rest on columns, it can rest on any number of structural supports. In this case, in the case of Hagia Sophia and all the churches that came after it, it rests on what are called pendentives, these triangular curved surfaces that, in the case of Hagia Sophia, uh, actually embed within the walls. So when you enter into this building and you look up, you feel you have this object floating over you. you it, it's, it's arguably impossible to understand how uh, it's supported. The sequence of this building, um, well actually let me say this, the, the form itself was so dazzling that even uh, Constantinople's conquerors uh, appropriated it, and you'll see that in a few minutes. A thousand years after this building was built, the Ottoman architect Sinan was designing mosques based on the same structure and uh, spatial principles, and they're still standing today. In all fairness, he also worked on the restorations of this original building. So as we take a look at some of these shots, and again, I promised I'd make this short just to give you some grounding, I want you to look at these images and hear the quote that Procopius made. The church has been made a spectacle of great beauty, stupendous to those who see it, and altogether incredible of those who hear it. Its breadth and length have been so fittingly proportioned that it may without impropriety be described as being both very long and extremely broad. It boasts of an ineffable beauty. The subtlety combines its mass and the harmony of its proportions. Um, it abounds exceedingly in gleaming sunlight. You might say that the interior space is not illuminated by the sun from the outside, but that the radiance is generated within so that a great and abundance of light bathes the shroud and shrines it all around. Uh, upon completion, Hagia Sophia remained the greatest enclosed space in the world for nearly a thousand years reign that only ended after the rebuilding of St. Peter's in Rome or during the Renaissance. A bit about the Ottoman period. Hagia Sophia's transformation into a mosque uh, was as simple as declaring it as such by the Sultan when mosaic, while mosaics were covered and Christian symbols were removed or unfortunately destroyed. Architecturally and spatially, uh, not much changed with the original structure. Mehmed II ordered a restoration of the building after its conversion. A mirror was added in the apse. Carpets were introduced over the floors, and over time, the large-scale architectural components like minarets on the exterior, as well as the mausoleums of sultans and other things, were added. A library, school, uh, sultan's lodge, etc. Um, Hagia Sophia's impact can't be understated. The, here are arguably Sinan, Sinan's two most famous mosques, both in Istanbul, the Blue Mosque and the Suleimani Mosque, and you can see the, uh, the plan and the, uh, the building that they're based on, both designed in the 15th century, a thousand years after Hagia Sophia was built. So these are some shots I've taken over the years as I've visited. It's uh, a transcendent space. It's a space that uh, affects you uh, if you're uh, of the Hellenic world, if, if you're of the architectural world, the combination is, is pretty breathtaking. And it's a, a place that um, continues to uh, have a place in our modern uh, geopolitical dialogue, which I, I think we're going to get into uh, fairly shortly. This is one image that I always like to refer to because I don't think there are, there's any other image associated with this building and popular culture that most uh, explains the, the, the situation and the kind of the, the center of the hurricane that this building has been in. And on that note, uh, I thank you, and uh, we'll ask Alexander. Very difficult to follow uh, what John has done. My presentation's a bit more pedestrian, and uh, my photos, the few that they are, certainly lack the skill. I am uh, married to an architect, but uh, while I have an appreciation for architecture, the talent is definitely lacking. And about the legacy of Hagia Sophia, one of my favorite churches uh, is in Serbia, in the capital, Belgrade, my wife's home country, St. Sava Cathedral, built recently. It's the largest church in the Balkans, if we accept, of course, uh, the original St. Sophia. I call it St. Sophian in its splendor, and all of my Serbian friends and the Byzantinologists of Serbia and uh, Belgrade University has one of the best faculties of Byzantinology in the world, probably rivaled only by uh, our own Thessaloniki in Greece. 
he says that Saint so uh, that uh, Sveti Sava, Saint Sava Cathedral, is a deliberate stamp of Byzantine orthodoxy on Serbia. So, and the Serbs uh, call Constantinople Tsarigrad, the city of the Tsars. It, it goes to what I want to talk about, the totality of the Byzantine Commonwealth and how it's really unfortunately hidden. So let's go to popular culture, uh, the silver screen. Have we ever seen a movie depicting the Byzantines? Uh, you have to think for a minute. Do you, does anyone know any? There's a few Serbian, Greek, and Bulgarian documentaries that I struggled to find. But there is, in fact, one, a Turkish blockbuster. And anyone familiar with the Turkish cinema industry knows it's one of the world's largest. They've got extremely talented actors and digital editors. Well, they did a blockbuster called Fatih 1453. We had to wait for the Turks to do a blockbuster on this seminal event in our history and in world history. There's no Western film depicting the Byzantines, and as I've said, the successor states, what I call Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Russia, they don't talk about uh, this in their cinema industries either. For all practical purposes, on the silver screen, there is no Byzantium. I had, well, I don't really wouldn't call it the pleasure of seeing uh, Petit 1453, but it was very interesting. The, it was a high budget, very well done blockbuster. Uh, depicting the Byzantines, including Constantine Paleologos, who I think the weight of history would show was a great hero, depicted him as a scheming coward. Uh, the Turks is brave and virtuous. Now, I certainly will attest that the Turks are brave. But virtuous, I think, might be a bit difficult. Uh, for example, Mehmet II, while he was a brilliant commander and a brilliant statesman, was also depicted as a uh, father and husband of one wife, with one child, and upon entering St. Sophia, having conquered it, he was kissing babies. He would have been a great American politician. <laughs> what was interesting in the, uh, in the Turkish media post-movie is that a few pundits uh, said that it reminded the Turks that their greatest city and some of its greatest monuments were built by another. And a lot of the Turks seem to have forgotten that well, the rest of the world did too. I, I recall the song, uh, Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. And of course, by not doing anything or saying anything, we are directly leading into that same mindset. So this is the only film to depict the historic event. Well, what about in print uh, and in school? Well, most of us uh, who've been educated in the U.S. will remember Western civilization as going from the glories of ancient Greece to ancient Rome, and then basically staying on the Western side of the Adriatic. So when Rome fell, we talk about the Vikings, the Dark Ages, but East Rome, which lasted for another thousand years, seems to be forgotten. When we talk about defending Europe against the onslaught of uh, the Muslims, we talk about Charles Martel but we don't talk about the Byzantines constantly defending Christendom, European civilization, from Islam. Byzantine literature, culture, and science, uh, well, they're all forgotten along with the Byzantines. Islamic Spain, rightfully, is given its due and in a more of a uh, re-examining of the historical record, we're giving due to this amazing civilization and the tolerance within. But Byzantium is neither examined or re-examined. Now, there certainly are amazing scholars, British, German, Greek, Russian, Bulgarian, Serbian, of Byzantium. But again, in terms of conventional wisdom and literature, I would suggest that Byzantium is very much hidden in plain sight. And let's talk about the Crusades. Again, they're being rightfully re-examined for their viciousness to the Arab world their absolute destruction of, of Arab civilization, their viciousness towards Jews. But again, the destruction of Fourth Crusade, which wasn't the only case of Crusader uh, venality towards the Byzantines, is again somehow glossed over or forgotten. And again, I've seen the four horses that John mentions in, uh, in Italy. I think there was one fellow, uh, a Polish pope, who did apologize 
for the Fourth Crusade in Athens. If that's, uh, I'm not absolutely certain, so if I'm wrong, please correct me from the crowd, but there hasn't been much discussion about it. So what's the result? Well, now that Hagia Sophia, like the Hagia Sophia in Trebizond, which is also a beautiful structure, its potential and probable reconversion to a mosque receives less attention than it should. Like the song says, it's nobody's business but the Turks. Uh, I had the pleasure of living three years in Serbia. My wife is Serbian-American. Well, I remember when Yugoslavia was falling apart uh, and there was plenty of blame to go around. It was Serbia that was othered and vilified as the, the place fell apart. Uh, certainly, while we can lay plenty of blame at the financial crisis to the hands of the Greeks, I would suggest that Greece is treated like a second-class European country and the other Balkan countries are as well. And unfortunately, uh, the, there's a lot of frozen conflicts in the Balkans and the worst may be yet to come. And again, we, we don't talk about our unique Byzantine culture either amongst the Byzantine successors or into the, the rest of the world. Well, let's talk briefly about the successor states. I would suggest that we all contribute to the silence about Byzantium because each Balkan country orients itself to the West. Uh, in Greece, we have, apologies for the word, maybe it's too strong a word, we have the, the cult of the ancients, the admiration of the ancients to a degree to the detriment of our high medieval civilization. In Serbia, I mean, I would suggest that the Serbs are actually the proudest Byzantines. If you look at so many things in Serbia, they incorporate Byzantine culture, but in Serbia too, there was the, the emphasis on the South Slav ling, uh, ethno-linguistic group uniting, again, to the detriment of its uh, Byzantine links. Bulgaria, uh, they basically, unfortunately, wanted to differentiate themselves from the Greeks and the Serbs, even though we all possessed this common Byzantine civilization, and Romania, would uh, emphasize its Latin linguistic uh, roots to connect to France and to Italy. So we all look to the West, which from an economic standpoint made sense, but we also neglected to look to each other and to our own history. And yet, the Balkan states do have so much in common. Uh, generally, we're Orthodox Christian. Now, there's certainly plenty of diversity which should be celebrated. Our culture, based in the Byzantine Orthodox tradition, with certainly variations, has a great deal of commonalities, and we lived for so many years under common jurisdictions, whether that was ancient Rome, Byzantium, and uh, for good or for bad, the Ottoman era. One of my personal heroes, aside from Constantine Paleologos, is Riga Spereos, uh, what the uh, Serbians call Riga Odfere, also very much honored by the Serbs. He dreamed of overthrowing the Sultan and creating a Byzantine federal republic. And this republic was to have all citizens be equal, regardless of faith, regardless of background, along the French revolutionary model. It's not a very well-known fact, but both Serbs and Greeks fought and died in each other's revolution. Uh, Serbia's warrior king, Kara George, was a member of our Filikiateria. And there were also Greeks that went north to fight for Serbia. Romanians and Bulgarians fought for Greece as well. Once again, not very well known. And even as late as 1992, and this is a bit laughable, Milosevic proposed a confederation of Greece, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and Serbia. And if we look at the Greek investment regime from the 1990s till the uh, current financial crisis, all of the Greek investment generally went to countries of the Byzantine Commonwealth. Serbia, Phyron, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, Turkey, Russia. I lived on the Serbian-Hungarian um, Serbian, uh, Serbian border and the Serbian-Croatian border. You cross the border into Hungary, there's no more Eurobank, there's no more Alpha Bank, there's no more Echo. The same thing in Croatia. Fine. We know these facts, they're hidden in plain sight. Well, what can we do? Well, first of all, I think that Greeks in the United States are heavily represented in academia, in popular culture, and in Hollywood. 
So why is there no movie about Byzantium? When we've got great directors, great producers, I mean, are you telling me a thousand year civilization, there aren't stories? Justinian and Theodora, I mean, we did, uh, uh, we produced the movie Mamma Mia, great movie. Are you telling me there's no drama with Justinian and Theodora? What about Cyril and Methodius' journey to the Slavs? These monks with an alphabet army, with the Cyrillic alphabet, conquered an entire ethno-linguistic group that eventually reached Alaska. Nobody talks about it. What about the warrior hero, Digenisakritas? The literature of Anna Komnina, Constantine Paleologos. You want to talk about a, uh, a dramatic and tragic figure? And dozens moves more, or again, my personal favorite, Rigas Ferreos. If Troy and 300 could be hits, why not this? And as I said, the result of Fatigue 1453 was to remind the Turks that Constantinople was built by another. It reminds me of what President Obama said. You didn't build that, but who knows it? We have to talk about it. If we don't promote it, someone else will, and will make it their own. And I would also suggest, and I'm glad to have uh, so many Serbian friends here as well, that the successor states need to work together to promote the legacy of Byzantium. Speaking of promotion, just a quick plug of self-promotion. I have my books here today for sale and for signing. I thank you very much. Uh, the title of my presentation is A Year Sophia, Neither an Accident Nor a Miracle. Um, your presence here tonight is testament to the special place that Hagia Sophia has in history. Um, it's one of the most magnificent human creations, and, and it also provides more but usually ignored evidence of the incredible heights achieved by the Hellenic mind. And now I want to congratulate my two predecessors. We did not coordinate or speak, but this happens sometimes at events. I could not have asked for better in introductions both to the uh, architectural uh, uh, background of the Hagia Sophia or the historical background, so I have to thank you before I do anything else. Historians say that Greek science, and again, these are, these are the mainstream historians who often get it wrong. Uh, they say that Greek science, technology, and math, for all their enormous achievements, went as far as they could go by about the time of Christ. It's then said that the Arabs and Western Europeans mixing in what they learned from the Greeks, uh, along with what they learned uh, from the Persian and the Hindus, then took the next step. This sixth century masterpiece, I guess we could put up a yes, yeah, uh, proves that kind of thinking wrong. Only recently have historians acknowledged that European civilization received a major boost from translations of the books brought in by Greek scholars fleeing uh, the onslaught of the Turks in the 14th and 15th century. But even those historians missed the mark, I believe. Before printing, books were very rare and very expensive. For the knowledge they contain to have been passed down to us with all their complex ideas intact, I believe the scribes who painstakingly copied them through the centuries had to be overseen by scholars who understood what was being written for them. Uh, a testament to, to uh, what continued to survive in Constantinople even as the, as the empire began to be battered and, and, and shrunk. Um, I believe that what was vital for the Renaissance was not just those books, but having teachers from Byzantium who could help them understand what they, were what they were reading. So why didn't the Byzantines themselves create the science and the technology that emerged from the Renaissance? Well, I'm not a historian. I'm fairly well read on this topic. Uh, what we're doing here is an exercise in putting the Hagia Sophia into perspective and also a little exercise in alternate history. Um, first, in addition to the books that they received uh, and what was in those books, there had to be an intellectual and physical infrastructure for there to be an industrial revolution and a scientific revolution. In Western Europe, there were many universities and libraries, as well as states or businesses funding technological innovation. These also required a social and economic foundation, large and economically and intellectually vibrant urban centers. Those existed in the Greek-speaking Eastern Mediterranean world in Justinian's time. It's one of those things that historians have managed to push to the side. Uh, but by the, late eight, by the eighth century, a couple of centuries after Justinian, uh, they largely disappeared. Without going into details, there was a devastating sixth century plague that weakened the empire and crippled the economy. 
They probably wiped out 25% of the, of the East Roman population. The Persians took advantage of that and sacked the major cities of Asia Minor. Later, the Arabs inflicted even more damage, and those ci uh, cities fairly quickly devolved into little more than fortified settlements, except for what remained in Constantinople, but that wouldn't have been enough. Uh, for the area of being the scientific and, and industrial revolution, the entire East Mediterranean basin had to continue as it existed in the sixth century. It didn't happen. So what does the existence of the Aegisphere suggest would have happened had the empire not collapsed? The mere existence of the Aegisphere and the men who built it proved to me that in the uh, uh, in Justinian's era, it was one of those points in history, like 14th century China, as some historians say, uh, when the industri when industrial and scientific relation uh, revolutions could have taken place. Uh, we'll first take a look at mathematics. The words of Leonardo da Vinci and Galileo that the secrets of nature are embodied in math are famous. Um, there were equivalent minds in Justinian's time. Isidore of Miletus was one of the most distinguished mathematicians of his time, in addition to being a ma master builder. He's the first person in recorded history to describe that you could construct an ellipse, which is a very complex shape, by taking two pins and a spring and, and winding around that. Uh, for him to have done that and for him to have noted it in his books meant that he was very interested in, in, in the mathematics of ellipses. Uh, that became important in Western European uh, history a thousand years later. It was very important at the time when Hagia Sophia was being built. Anthemios was just as brilliant, uh, but most importantly, he liked to experiment. He came from a family of great intellectual distinction uh, and displayed theoretical acumen as well as imagination, tenacity, and the touch of madness. Um, all four are vital to, uh, to being a revolutionary. I want to share one story from his life which you may have heard of. He was noted for exploring the power of steam. Um, he also had a neighbor that he didn't like. He was kind of litigious, and he wanted to punish him. So Anthemius reportedly had workers tunnel under the man's house, um, right up to the main beams of that house. Underneath them, he set up a huge kettle of water, which he boiled, connected with pipe work to the beams. So that when the water boiled and the steam was conducted to the, to the, to the uh, floor, uh, the, earth, the house shook violently, and his neighbor fled screaming, fearing that there was an earthquake. Because <laughs> he gave the central heat. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the, that's significant because later on we might discuss about the importance of earthquakes. In every century since a Sophia was built, there was a major earthquake in Constantinople, at least 7.0 on the Richter scale, every 100 years. There hasn't been one in about 140 years. Yes, Constantinople is overdue for the big one. Uh, there's no evidence that Anthemios successfully made the leap to working machines, steam engines, etc. But Anthemios and his colleagues had teachers and had students all over the Mediterranean basin. So the question is to me, how many generations away were they from building steamboats and steam locomotives? And by the way, the Greeks knew about uh, running carts on rails, on tracks. Uh, that was the case throughout Mediterranean history uh, in, in mines. Uh, and as may, many of you know, there was also tra track work uh, uh, that allowed uh, uh, ships to cross the Isthmus of Panama. So all these elements were existed. What happened was the economic and intellectual found, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, political uh, uh, foundations collapsed. There was one vital uh, uh, substance that was missing for industrial revolution, steel. They didn't have steel. Uh, they were advanced in, in wrought iron work, and you can see those uh, uh, in many buildings, but steel was necessary. Alexandria, however, and Constantinople were centers of alchemy, a little known fact. Um, today, most scholars consider alchemy not to be uh, a pseudoscience like astrology. They realize that the people who were involved in that uh, were engaged in pre-scientific activity. There's one more name uh, that I want to mention, and one more fact that was also would have been important in this alternate history. John Fidop how many people have heard of John Philoponus? One. John Philoponus was a mind who lived in Alexandria, time of Justinian, uh, um, probably of the caliber of Newton, Galileo, uh, and, and men like that. He was a distinguished professor who was educated in Athens, as was Is Isidore, and as I said, lived in, in Alexandria. He was as rebellious and he was brilliant. Later on, I can talk about why we don't know him as well. Uh, but he very much revered Aristotle, wrote some of the most important commentaries remaining on Aristotle, but he made a break away from him. 
Uh, his ideas stimulated, uh, there were certain ideas in Aristotle uh, because he was a pioneer in so many fields that were dead end. And we they had, scientists and thinkers had to move beyond them. Philoponos in the sixth century, a thousand years before, before Galileo uh, and, and those people uh, were starting to make that breakthrough. He developed an idea of motion, a theory of motion called impetus theory that was very well known in, in medieval Europe. It's a in, it's in, uh, vital intellectual step to our current understanding of, of, of gravity. Um, and we know for a fact that he developed it because Pico de la Mirandola, one, uh, one scholar and philosopher, and Galileo quoted him continuously. Galileo quoted, uh, quoted uh, John Philoponus dozens of times in his books. Now, histor some historians appreciate him. We don't know him as Greeks, but histo Western historians do appreciate him. Um, and some, he's been called one of those giants on which Newton said, if I've been able to see far, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. That Newton knew about John Philoponus, and as, as did the, his, his immediate predecessors. Among the things that, that uh, 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 Philoponus did was that he made the radical suggestion at the time that the stars are made of the same material, same substance, as the Earth. That enabled later thinkers to make important connections. He was the first to say that. It was believed that the stars had, were completely different, maybe even the divine substance. Um, he also hinted that he knew, a thousand years before Copernicus, that it was the sun that was the center of, of the world, uh, not, not the Earth. Um, and he was also the first, and this is the one that's most mind-blowing to me, and I keep bringing up Galileo. He was the one that suggested we could study gravity by dropping balls of different weight and different substance from the same height. Uh, there's evidence that the philosophers and scientists of the Justinian's times often gathered in different cities for conferences, a practice that would have been very important uh, to the uh, uh, industrial and scientific and technological revolutions that I suggest would take place. Um, clearly, these people were all in communication with each other. Clearly, they would have continued because they were making progress. Again, that collapsed uh, after the collapse of the, of the East Roman uh, reality in the 7th century. I'm going to leave off here with one final point uh, that uh, connected more to the um, uh, architecture and the art that we're here to talk about. Um, neither the Greeks nor the Romans alone could have made those breakthroughs that would be needed for these kind of revolutions. The former were a little bit lacking in their practice. The Greeks were a little bit lacking their in their in their uh, appreciation and passion for practical matters, but they had made more technological breakthroughs than we do give them credit for. Uh, the Romans were a little bit too impatient with the theoretical. But the East Romans, the Greeks who dominated the Roman East, might have had the right stuff. Just the blend of the practical and the theoretical, as is evidenced by projects like the Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia is obviously an incredible feat of engineering, but it was also a triumph of the theoretical mind. Even in Justinian's time, it might have been Procopius, um, it was described as pure mathematics executed in, in brick and stone. They fully, his, their contemporaries completely appreciated that it took a brilliant theoretical mind and great engineer to create something that magnificent. Um, the main elements of its structure make it feel like it's almost a living, breathing thing. And if, Timae, if Plato's Timaeus crosses your minds, uh, that's probably not a coincidence. Uh, these people, from Justinian to Athenius, Isidore, uh, and uh, uh, Philoponos, were very much, uh, were, were new, new, new Plato like the back of their hands. Um, I've noted that um, much of what was uh, the civilization that was the foundation of Justinian uh, disappeared quickly after the Arab invasions in the middle 6th century. After a few centuries, even educated Greeks could not conceive of a human era origin to this design. After Hagia Sophia, no building even half of its size was ever built in the Byzantine. Uh, some of you may have heard of this uh, myth about its, its uh, uh, miraculous origins. It goes something like this. Anthemios and Is Is Isidros, brilliant as they were, despaired of being able to design a building uh, that was uh, up to Justinian's ambitions. He was very, very disappointed, the emperor was. Soon afterwards, a humble farmer contacted him, contacted them, and invited them to his farm. He was a beekeeper, and he showed the master builders a humbling scene inside a large beehive the industrious little creatures built a model of the church that we now see today. It was a Hagia Sophia in beeswax. That's what the Byzantines believed for hundreds of years after they were no longer conceived that the technology or the science existed to build such a thing. As a structure, 
uh, it was the combination, cu culmination, not of classical Greek architecture, but as uh, uh, John showed, it was a combination of, of, of Roman architecture. The culmination of Greek architecture was, was the Parthenon. Um, but, the, but it was the creation of Greek-speaking Roman citizens, and it was indeed the pinnacle of Hellenic achievement. The Hagia Sophia instantaneously established a brand new aesthetic, which the Byzantines developed and perfected. Some of its elements were borrowed in the West, as again John pointed out. You can see the inspiration in, uh, 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 that happened with the architects of St. Peter's and with uh, uh, St. Paul's in, Rome, in, in, um, in London. Um, in the East, obviously, Hagia Sophia is surrounded by her Ottoman customs, the most impressive being, among them being the Blue Mosque, which we all for Shah. Um, Hagia Sophia continues to inspire. The dome of our new St. Nicholas, which is being built at Ground Zero, um, is almost an exact rendering of, of Justinian's, about half the scale. The only thing I want to conclude with is, as magnificent as that building is, and you can get a sense of that from those very photos, as amazing as was your experience when you saw it, it's not, it, it, it doesn't come close to what was, ex was experienced when Justinian was there. First of all, the exterior to survive those earthquakes had to be altered. It was once a very elegant building in its ex exterior. And in its exterior, the building through the centuries has lost about one half of its gold mosaic. Just imagine if every single uh, uh, ceiling surface was gold mosaic, but most importantly, it lost about one third of its window space. So it was that, that much more brilliant uh, phys physically um, and spiritually when you were there, and yet when you go there today, it is one of the great buildings that, that exists on Earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to have a little bit of time after Billy's presentation just to go into more of a discussion with the panel. Uh, and, and some of the things that I would like to, uh, to hit on when we, when we enter into that discussion is um, after all of this time, you know, why does this building continue to have uh, the impact it does? Just the fact that you can ponder as he's setting up. Uh, Hagia Sophia, as of 2014, was the second most visited museum in Turkey, uh, attracting more than uh, three and a half a million visitors annually. According to data released by the Turkish Culture and Tourism Ministry, Hagia Sophia was Turkey's most visited tourist attraction in 2015. Uh, I think this is because uh, the building means different things to different people. I mean, surely it can't be all Greeks <coughs> flying from Athens, not, uh, not three and a half million of them in one year. Maybe, I don't know. But it's something that, uh, that merits uh, talking about. Maybe I can, I can just ask, uh, Alex to comment uh, on something. Um, you were, uh, you spent some time in the Balkans and uh, you talked about the remnants of, uh, of Byzantium and kind of like the, uh, the, the shattered mosaic that it is today. Uh, after all of this time, why, why is there still so much uh, cultural disparity? Uh, that's the first part of the question in that part of the world, country to country. And why do you think that, uh, that that region is so marginalized uh, as far as the West is concerned. I mean, it was certainly marginalized uh, in the 19th century by Western Europe. They kind of saw the fall of Rome, and that was it, right, the Dark Ages. So why, why do you think that that is the case? Well, I think uh, that, first of all, I don't make the distinction between Greece and the other Balkan countries because I look at us as a cultural whole. Uh, I think that it's very difficult to say where Greece ends and Bulgaria begins. Uh, I think part of the whole Macedonian issue is that it's very hard to differentiate between East Romans simply based on uh, linguistic criteria. So I would say that the Balkans are a whole. Uh, I think each of the Balkan countries uh, as successor states have had similar uh, institutional problems, economic problems. They varied. I, Greece has had the advantage of geography, that it's uh, a maritime country. Uh, I guess geography is destiny, and it's made Greeks from the ancient times to be seafarers and merchants. This uh, is certainly a better place to be than uh, 
in a high mountain village where you may have uh, the ability to defend yourself, but you're not going to be on key trade routes. So I think that Greece is differentiated in that way. But all of the countries uh, have similar corruption problems, have similar uh, problems with their legal and institutional systems. They often refer to the bureaucracies and their leaders in the same way. Uh, the, the Serbian term for a leader is often Pasha, just as we might say in Greece. Uh, some of the same terms often inherited from the Ottomans. You will hear in Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania. So I, I think that we've all suffered from an, an inability to reform our institutions along Western lines. We basically decapitated the Muslim Pashas and we put in Christian ones. Um, I think Greece's differentiation has been geography more than anything in that we're a maritime and merchant nation more than uh, some of the other Balkan nations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a very, very interesting project and that is fusing, uh, I guess, heavy metal music, right? Is that, would you call it that genre? That, with, uh, with Byzantine history, which, uh, you know, uh, is quite an interesting combination. They've actually written uh, a rock opera about a certain moment in history, and this is the, uh, I guess this is the teaser for it, right? So, so this is kind of a, um, a quick snapshot of what this project is about, right? Okay, so we'll take a look at it, and then Billy will be the last of our, of our formal uh, panelists, and then we're just gonna open it up to a, a brief conversation. So. Through film and music, um, and how I've come to create Byzantium in, in a modern context. I know we're talking about Hagia Sophia. You're gonna see some references to that through these videos. Uh, there's a, a movie, uh, the band before Porphyra, and what we're doing now with our trilogy, the rock opera, the debut of Carnegie Hall, and uh, off Broadway, and it's a Byzantine rock opera, telling the story of Anna and Vladimir, which I will talk about that right afterwards, but I wanna bore you. This is something, uh,
is going to win. He has no competition. He can't be beat. He won't be beat. He's never been beat. He don't even beat himself off as a teenager. I'm aware of everything. And then we're going to Disneyland. <laughs> a second golden age for Greece. But trouble moves ahead. Russian Grand Prince Vladimir marches towards Constantinople with visions of conquest while civil war threatens to destroy the empire from within. Will Greece survive? Will love be strong enough to overcome that which sword and shield could not? This is the story of Anna and Vladimir. Porfira, the love that rocked the world. history, um, humor, a little bit of sexy, but uh, as you can see, uh, but apparently, um, I'm sorry, but Porfira is, is a big project. Uh, it, it comes from a, a background, that's my background, uh, with independent film, with, uh, I've been to Turkey numerous times, Hagia uh, Sofia, Kapadokia, Trabzon, I've been to Serbia, Russia, I've done my research, I, I have a Russian partner, I have my my good partner here, Peter Yakumis, he was a director for the Constantinople video. Uh, as you saw here, Mike Salvas is part of the, the team as well. Uh, the film Attila Attacks was about a Turkish terrorist that was planning a, and he was planning a coup d'etat from Northern Cyprus, but hiding out in America long before. This from 2001, we had filmed this until 2007. It's a comedy. It, it, it highlights a lot of things about our community. Uh, it talks about orthodox unity, how we should know more about the Serbs, the Armenians, uh, Ethiopians, uh, Russians, uh, and Bulgarians. And uh, yeah, it was a comedy. It's uh, somewhere, it'll be, uh, it's in the making still. But uh, the Constantinople video, as uh, Alexander had mentioned, um, nothing existed in 2009 where we were researching one of our epics from the previous version of Rafira, Phoenix Train. We had an epic about the fall of Constantinople and uh, based on the song I had written, uh, The Last Day on the Eve of the Fall. And there was no costumes. There was uh, no, nothing that existed, even a Paleologos outfit. We actually had to make everything. And Pete Yacumis uh, actually uh, made a lot of those costumes. We work with uh, living history organizations. 
uh, I'm, I'm bringing these things up because they exist, they are out there. Uh, like the, we had to form a Byzantine organization, a Byzantine regiment. We work with Janissaries, uh, reenactors from Maryland, which after they worked with us, uh, they actually started doing Byzantine uh, reenactment with the Greek warriors, the Spartans, with other Renaissance, trying to make things historically accurate for the period of the uh, uh, late Byzantium, the last 200 years. So there was a lot of detail involved, and I'm glad to see there's more on the internet now about things from that era. Uh, even miniatures, um, reenactments, not too many movies. Uh, that movie from the, the, the Turkish side. Uh, there's one Russian serial, actually a series about Sofia Paleologina. That's a hit right now in Russia. It's the niece of Paleologos, uh, Mary Ivan III. And uh, that's pretty good because actually that deals with our trilogy as well. But that's very minimum. So you know, we are sort of pioneers in our own way. I'm sure a lot of you don't know about this stuff. So this is a good way to find out uh, what we've been doing. All that formed, and also we've been uh, promoters of the, uh, the Tririn, the uh, Olympias. We, we helped promote um, the ancient ship. Uh, I helped produce an opera of my partner in Greece, Panagiotis Caruso, The Olympic Flame, which um, deals with Hercules and the founding of the Olympic Games, based on um, the women of Tractis. So I, I do opera and rock opera. But ultimately, everything leads to Porfirio Grecian Rock Opera, which is the story of Anna and Vladimir. I'll read you a quick um, a scenario, very quickly, what it's about. We debuted in uh, May 2015 in Carnegie Hall. We were the first Greek-themed rock opera, electric rock opera to debut at Carnegie Hall. Uh, very successfully, we worked with two dance organizations, the Society Dance, uh, the Dina Stevens Society Dance um, Project, and the uh, Greek American Folklore Society, actors, the 12 piece rock orchestra, it was a very, very extensive um, production, telling the story of these two important people in the time of Basil II, the so-called Booger Slayer. But I never wanted to deal with that aspect because there was more to Basil the Booger Slayer, Basil II. If you ever read Penelope Deltas' uh, books, Costas Kiriazis, uh, and so forth, he is a very important um, emperor of Byzantium. So the year is 98 AD. Emperor Basil II rules over Byzantium, Eastern Roman Empire, medieval Greece, whatever you want to call it, we call it Byzantium, because that's what most people uh, know it as. His reign will ultimately usher a second golden age for Greece. This is the Macedonian dynasty of the Middle Ages, uh, higher still Alexander's. This is another Macedonian dynasty. Uh, for 200 years he reigned, one of the many in Byzantium, but the most, one of the most successful ones. Uh, but dro trouble brews ahead. The empire is in turmoil. The aristocratic elite, along with the great landowning families, dominate the empire's administration, military, and finances. Furthermore, civil war threatens to destroy Constantinople from within, as two wealthy military warlords of Anatolia, Bardas Skleros and Bardas Fokas, declare open rebellion against Basil's authority. So there was turmoil during the scenario of our story. There was a civil war, much like it repeats a lot of times in our history. And on another front, there were more problems. Russian Grand Prince Vladimir, uh, emerges triumphant after a fratricidal war and begins the unification of the Kievan Rus. His new southern borders bring him in contact with the Greek colonies of the Crimea. He occupies the Greek city of Personisos. Uh, across the Black Sea lies the golden jewel of the world, Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Ambitious to attain more glory, he marches towards Constantinople and visions of conquest. You heard some of the songs, they're all from Porphyra, except for uh, Phoenix Rain. Uh, from our new album in the previous, uh, Faith, Struggle, Victory, this is Avon and Nikki's. The new album is called The Star Maker's Prophecy. Uh, to continue, Vladimir's grandmother, St. Olga, one of the first Greek Orthodox Christian converts in Russia, urges him to stop his march to Constantinople. As his mentor, she advises him that there is more to be attained for young Russia by embracing the culture and religion of the Greeks than by fighting them. Being besieged by both internal and external forces, Basil dispatches his sister Anna to negotiate a treaty with Vladimir. Uh, uh, smitten Vladimir seeks truce only if he can marry the Porfirogenita, a princess born of the royal purple, hence the name Porfira also, the purple chamber in Constantinople, where all emperors and empresses were crowned. Anna refuses to marry a pagan barbarian, but her role in history sets her apart from all before her as she will play a pivotal role in the future of both nations. Vladimir, for the moment, has his eyes fixed on the prize, Princess Anna in the city of gold. Will Greece survive? Will love be strong enough to overcome that which sword and shield cannot? 
This is the story of Anna Porfirogenita and Vladimir the Great. Porfira the Love, the Rock, the World. So that's the background of the story. Uh, it's performed as a rock opera, similar to Transfer Via and Orchestra, and it has the potential to become a musical like Phantom the Opera and Rent. It's the same story that can go both ways. Uh, we did the Players Theater this past May for three days, that's off Broadway, and we're gonna take it to more, um, more theaters and, and other places in uh, New York City. So that's a little bit about that. Uh, it's a very important, uh, it's, it's not just the music and the story, it deals with Vladimir, which uh, when he was choosing a religion back in the 10th century, he sent emissaries all over the world to uh, see what religion will suit the Russians, to, to the Catholics, the Germans, the, the, the Muslims, the Jewish, and, uh, and the Greek Orthodox. And um, when his emissaries went to Hagia Sophia, they were so uh, awestruck that they went back to him and they told him this place of the Greeks in Constantinople in Hagia Sophia is where God lives. This is the faith for you. So that's the tie-in. And uh, if you need more information, for fear of rock opera, for fear of band, then uh, you can uh, ask me later. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Very, very I, think, I think what we're doing in particular is, is very interesting and very compelling for anybody who's part of what I call the broader Greek American experience. Because other than going to Greek school as a kid or you know hearing things from your relatives, for example, you know there's this myth of the Marble King that I heard uh, from my grandmother, uh, who, who said it with such conviction that you know for a long time I thought it was true. Uh, that uh, that this king is resting until Constantinople uh, is, is taken back. But, uh, but the broader point is uh, that you're actually taking uh, this cultural aspect that many of us have kind of filed in the back of our minds as part of our childhood or upbringing, and you're really making it very contemporary, and you're, in your own way, uh, bringing it to the forefront. So I think that's very interesting. We don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. We always run out of time. So I'm just gonna throw one uh, comment, one question out to the panel that will take us back to, to the original theme and then Lou will make some announcements and we'll have to wrap up. But the, the, the question, I mean, there's so many things about, about this building that one can speak about, but this is the elephant in the room question. This is what I call it. And that is, we know that um, there's a growing movement in Turkey a lot of it has to do with the political climate in the country about uh, retaking the building, re-utilizing re, uh, it as a mosque, bringing it back to that. It was articulated by a high-ranking Turkish official. Everybody is entitled to their opinion. Everybody has different viewpoints as to, as to what Hagia Sophia should be. We all know how it began. We all know what it is now. The question is, from your perspectives, and I can, I can give you my perspective as well, What? Who does this building belong to? What does it belong to? And what should it be? Let's start with Billy, because you were the last one to say. Uh, well, we all know it belongs to. It should belong to the world. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a world heritage uh, right. building. It's culture. If it's possible that it can have some services for the Orthodox and, and I guess even for the for the Muslim faith, that would be great. But that's my opinion on that. So you see it more as a, a broader. It should definitely be restored. And a lot of its mosaics should, should definitely be restored, yeah. though. One of the things I read in my research is that the, the irony of covering these mosaics in plaster is that it effectively preserved them. So here you have a very funny situation where you're trying to, to hide something uh, and diminish it, and in fact, you're actually preserving it. And the last time I was there, which was maybe three or four years ago, I did see there are certain sections within archways and things where they're kind of surgically removing the plaster and selectively restoring uh, parts of the mosaic. Dean, what do you think? Well, um, we have to pay close attention um, because uh, right now uh, it is in Turkey and it is a museum. And I argue that it's, it's the best thing for us, uh, against, except for one possibility. The second, because we as Orthodox Christians can go there and pay our respects and have our experience uh, in a building uh, relatively Unmolested. Um, I don't think they will convert. There are many forces in Turkish politics, 
including perhaps some weird dynamics in the mind of everyone himself, um, that explain why he's bringing this up now. Uh, I don't think he will convert it into a mosque anytime soon, mainly because uh, it makes so much money. It also funds, the, 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 the admission to Hagia Sophia funds the Turkish archaeology budget. The only reason Turkey is concerned about archaeology is because it drives tourism. So there are, there's a huge economics um, dimension here. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I don't think he's given up on uh, eventually joining the European Union. Um, and um, even if he doesn't, Tur Turkey, the Turkish establishment have not either. Uh, and um, that would cause tremendous problems if he were to just flat out convert it into a mosque. <laughs> What some people have discussed in the media, Turkish and non-Turkish media, is the idea of, of sharing it, which initially is impressive because it is a fact that for many centuries in Asia Minor, uh, when the, the, uh, before the Turks were able to build their own structures, the most magnificent buildings in every town in Asia Minor was the Greek church. Uh, but before the mass uh, uh, loss of, of um, uh, people to the Orthodox faith into Islam, um, the, church, the Greeks needed their churches too. They need to be social peace, so they did compromise and share churches in Asia Minor. That could be done. What worries me is that, uh, as clever as Erdogan is, he could make a deal uh, saying that there would be Muslim services only on Friday nights, church services Saturday morning, they won't give us the name, maybe in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, south, uh, Southern Gallery, where the, there are magnificent mosaics. Um, and that could go on for a few months, maybe a couple of years, um, but then he could change his mind and stop the Orthodox services and leave us only with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the church again becoming a mosque. Um, of course, from Monday to Thursday, as was discussed in this one article, it would remain a museum because, because they need that money. But we have to be vigilant. Uh, the good thing is there are individuals and institutions that are doing tremendous work in keeping an eye on Turkey, and uh, uh, especially the archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate uh, and various organizations in Washington, D.C. Uh, that are fighting for religious freedom, that are fighting for uh, the well-being and protection of the Patriarchate, and will also, uh, without a doubt, make a lot of noise uh, if, if things start looking very bad about the ESOP as a, as a, uh, as a mosque. And uh, now it's, what's well, your take? Just, just very briefly, uh, I think the status quo is the best situation. Uh, I look at it as a citizen of the world, uh, trying to separate from the fact that, yes, I am a Greek Orthodox Christian, and we have a tie to it. I think it's uh, part of the cultural commons of the world, and whether you're religious or not, uh, it, it's, it's so awe-inspiring, and uh, I don't want to be in a situation whereby we lose it, or we don't have some sort of Bamiyan Buddha situation going where it's either destroyed or taken over, I just pray that it can remain with the status quo. Yeah. Well, I, I tend to agree, and, and my, my closing comment on this issue is, well, having visited it so many times and seeing the reaction of people of all faiths, including people of no faith, exactly. that, uh, that enter this building, they all are kind of stunned into silence and take in effectively what is a great, great uh, landmark and moment in human history. And regardless of your uh, dogma or your religion or your, your point of view, that's just something that's universally undeniable. So I think it's also funny that, that in a way, it, as it goes through an identity crisis, so does Europe, so does Turkey, so does the United States. So there's this constant sense of upheaval and, and it's very well uh, represented uh, by the present status and the questionable status of this uh, amazing building. On that note, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I know we were a bit skittish with our audio. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Lou. Thank you again uh, for attending tonight. Uh, just a couple of points that I think are very important to note. And, and I also agree with John and, and uh, Alexander and some of the other people on the panel that it's not only, it wasn't only the greatest uh, for a thousand years uh, Christian edifice, but it was also one of the greatest Muslim edifices. And, and it in fact became the, the model uh, for uh, imperial mosques uh, throughout the city. You know, John had mentioned Sinan, who was the uh, greatest uh, uh, Muslim architect in terms of building mosques, he was the most famous, and no one has equaled him. 
Sinan, of course, was a, was a Christian who was uh, taken as a child and uh, was a janissary, who in fact became uh, an architect and designed those, those particular mosques. I will say that the mosques, uh, and you're correct, John, no one has uh, equaled, even Sinan, who was the, the greatest, uh, equaled Hagia Sophia. Uh, he did, in fact, do some of the most fantastic mosques uh, in the city itself and, and outside of the city. And uh, what, what uh, they lack on the exterior is basically fantastic on the interior, in particular as it relates to their, to their tile work. And, uh, you know, just as, as a reference for the Hellenophiles here, uh, the Blue Mosque, the exterior of the Blue Mosque was actually the stone, the stones from the Hippodrome that John showed early in the photograph. So the stonework that was taken from there was actually to build uh, the Hippodrome. The other thing, just to understand uh, the, re the relationship and, and how important uh, it is also to, uh, to the Islamic faith, many of their flags and what they believe is, mu is Muslim, for example, or Islamic, is the star and crescent. So if you see the star and crescent, um, it is associated with Islam. But the star and crescent is actually the, the symbols of Constantinople. When Mehmed II uh, in 1453 conquered the city, he took the Star and Crescent of Constantinople and it became the symbol of, of Islam. So there's a definite linkage. I do agree that, uh, that we should not make it one or the other. It should be universal. And that, in fact, will preserve it uh, for centuries versus trying to convert it into something. And I think, I think uh, Erdogan has made a, a big mistake, in my opinion, of, of trying to just go in one, one particular angle. I will say just a couple of other points, and I apologize for speaking about Hagia Sophia. But it's not only a, you know, an, an edifice that was produced in, uh, well, the, thir the third uh, iteration produced in 537, but in fact, the columns and, and a lot of the interior of Hagia Sophia was, was taken from, from ancient monuments throughout the empire. If you go to Hagia Sophia, for example, and if you look at the pictures, you'll see different types of columns. And they're basically from ancient edifices. In other words, way before the Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so that's important. I don't particularly care just like I don't particularly care for the word Greece, I prefer Elas or the Hellenic Republic. Uh, just a comment of mine, I don't particularly care for the word Byzantine also. Uh, the terminology Byzantine is something that never existed. These people that lived in that particular age never called themselves Byzantines. They called themselves Romans. And I prefer to refer to the, uh, to the particular age that we're talking about as, the, in the West, sometimes we call it the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, these were the Romanic people. In fact, when, uh, when they conquered Constantinople, meaning the, the, uh, the fourth crusaders, who did the most damage, by the way, it wasn't Mehmed who came in. He at least showed respect and honor to Hagia Sophia. It was, really, it was really the fourth crusaders who came in, who destroyed a lot of the city, who ripped it apart, stole a lot of the objects, and they were all in the major cathedrals throughout Europe, not only the four horses, but all types of objects, uh, holy objects, uh, you know, throughout throughout the West. But when you read the con what what took place uh, when they conquered it and and what they did and how they desecrated Hagia Sophia in fourteen oh uh, you know twelve oh four, it it really it really unnerves you. And in fact, many people talk about the so called uh, you know split between the Western and Eastern churches uh, as being uh, ten fifty four the so called Great Schism. No, it didn't happen at that particular point in time because within, within the cathedrals themselves throughout the East, they still recognized the, the Bishop of Rome or the Pope of Rome until 1204 when in, fact, when in fact they conquered the city. That was the break between the, the East and the West in terms of Christianity. And uh, it's correct, you know, what Alexander mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, the recent uh, pope that, that basically apologized for it, but most people didn't even understand what he was talking about. But that particular incident, more than anything else, continues to create a division between the East and the West.
I apologize for diverting and talking a little bit about, about a, a circumstance in Hagia Sophia. I would like to announce a, a, couple of, a couple of things. Our next event, our next event will be Yanana in the court of Ali Pasha, Child Harold Reconsidered. In that particular forum, what we're going to discuss uh, is bring different aspects of Ali. We will talk uh, from the Hellenic uh, perspective, from the Albanian perspective, from the Turkish perspective, and really discuss uh, what uh, Catherine Fleming, uh, who will also appear, a very famous uh, historian, in her book, The Muslim Bonaparte. And, uh, you know, fascinating, fascinating person in terms of Hellenic history, as well as Albanian history and, and, uh, and uh, the Balkan history. So that's gonna be a fantastic event. Again, we do both culture and we do, and we do um, you know, business. So uh, the next two events after that will be more business re uh, related. We will go into the uh, food industry, okay, which relates to something that I did when uh, I was invited to uh, the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce uh, last week uh, to speak uh, you know, to them in Athens. And then we're going to do a development design and construction uh, event in, uh, in March. We did indicate that we're going to continue the Byzantine series. This is the first of the Byzantine series. We will do an event, obviously, on Hagia Sophia. I'd also like you to note uh, in your calendars, if you're around tomorrow, uh, when we did the shipping, uh, the shipping panel discussion, I was invited to Cosmos FM. Uh, to discuss the shipping, um, the shipping panel discussion, which was a fantastic panel discussion, and after that, after that uh, discussion, they asked me if I would, if I would like to to host the program every other week. So tomorrow will be the first program that I'll have, uh, and and my uh, my program will be called uh, East Mediterranean Business and Culture, and we'll discuss both business uh, uh, type issues as well as cultural issues. And tomorrow, for the first, uh, you know, first in a series of, uh, of my hosting, um, you know, every other week, I will discuss the uh, Hagia Sophia in a lot more details. And John, I'll have John uh, also to be on the program. So it'll be at uh, Cosmos FM 91.5 uh, between 7 and 8. I'd like now to introduce uh, Despina uh, Afentudi, uh, the, the press office director of the uh, of the uh, club for uh, UNESCO of Pidaas and the islands to make a couple of presentations. Good evening. On behalf of the president of the club uh, for UNESCO of Piraeus and Islands, uh, Mr. Ioannis Maronidis, I would like to congratulate the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance for organizing the December 7, 537 AD, Hagia Sophia, its history, architecture, and cultural contributions event, which is uh, taking place in association with the New York chapter of the Hellenic American Institute, I have at the Adelphi chapter 25 in Manhattan, and the Club for UNESCO of Burios and Islands here in Manhattan. Hagia uh, Sophia is not only a symbol of orthodoxy, but also, as we all agreed, a world cultural heritage and also historical architectural wonder that still remains standing. It is our duty to remember Hagia Sophia's history and pass it to the next generations. The reason why we decided to support this event is because we strongly believe that especially in times of crisis, striving for social cohesion, social participation, and protecting, promoting, and transmitting our cultural heritage are all of great importance in order to overcome the difficulties. Please allow me to refer just two examples of what UNESCO Furious and Islands does in Greece. It supports thousands of Greeks and immigrants who are living in poverty, and also it promotes the return of the Parthenon marbles to the new Acropolis Museums in Athens. So um, at this point, I'd like to personally congratulate all the speakers for their participation and also the organizers of the event for their contribution to culture. First, um, I'd like to call Bespina, who's host, to help me with your words. And I'll start with the Mr. Luis Cachos, the president and founder of EMBC. 
the group work. Okay, Mr. John Fakialis, architect, vice president, co-founder of EMBCA. Mr. Kosadain Sirigos, journalist, international commentator. Uh, Mr. Bill Christopher, composer, producer of Porfira Grayson Rock Opera, who's also um, who's also uh, the director of modern music of uh, UNESCO Persian Islands. Uh, Mr. Nicolas Mahiaras, technical support. And last but not least, my Chris Kosavas, Porfira Guitarist. And because the award was given earlier before, <laughs> Mr. Alexander Bellinis, the author. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of things. Uh, what was mentioned was the trireme, the Olympias trireme. And EMCA is also working with people to bring the trireme to New York. Okay, that's one of our goals, and we're going to accomplish it. The other thing is the one person who's not from New York is Alexander Bolinas. I thank you so much for coming here tonight. Alexander has written two fabulous, fabulous books. He'll be here for a few minutes. Anyone who wants to pick them up, please do. He'll personally autograph them. I've read them both. One is The Eagle Has Two Faces. Spectacular book. This novel is extremely interesting, quite frankly, historically, and it has a lot to do with genealogy uh, of many of us or some of us. Hidden Mosaics and Aegean Tale. Stop by, say hello to uh, Alexander, pick up his book, and let him autograph it. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.